thank you everyone for joining. My name is Stuart Gillespie. I'm a, a non-resident senior fellow at uh, IFRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, and I am a consultant with the Food Foundation. Thank you for joining this 90-minute uh, webinar. This is the first of four regional webinar webinars on embedding food justice in urban food strategies. Uh, this is the uh, African region looking at innovations and experiencing, experiences. It's a partnership between the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, the Food Foundation and Birmingham City Council. And the aim is really to accelerate the global movement to ensure all people have access to healthy, nutritious and culturally appropriate food and diets, regardless of who they are, where they are. It's the uh, essential principle of food justice that, that takes in issues of power, of equity um, and sovereignty. Uh, thank you for joining. We have uh, just one or two housekeeping uh, announcements to make. The first is please feel free to put your name and say hi in the chat, say who you are, where you are. Uh, if and when you feel you have a question, please add that to the Q&A, which you should see the button at the bottom of your screen, and we will uh, curate those questions for, for the end of the session. Uh, we have quite a, a packed session, which, which is great, with a lot to discuss. Um, uh, and uh, the first uh, part of that will be a set of reflections on experiences with projects in Eastern Southern Africa. Um, but prior to that, we will have an introduction from uh, Leticia Petrovich from the Food Foundation and from Cecile Michel from MUSPP, uh, which we can uh, open this session with uh, shortly. I'm just looking at, uh, okay, we have several participants joining, that's great. So I think um, uh, we can go ahead and just open it up with uh, Leticia, if you would like to introduce a global Food Justice Pledge, and then we will ask Cecile to come in and, and give an intro on the MUFPP process and initiative. So, uh, Leticia, if you, if you could do that. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Stuart, and thank you to all joining today. It's um, a pleasure to be able to co-host this session with um, Stuart and on behalf of the Birmingham City Council. So I just want to start with providing a bit of a background to this series of webinars and specifically the work that Food Foundation has been doing with Birmingham City Council. So um, this exciting learning opportunity follows on the launch of the Global Food Justice Pledge, uh, which was launched in 2021 Milan Pact Annual Gathering in Barcelona. Birmingham um, has been a long-standing member of the pact and has also served on the secretariat for the last two terms. And we really wanted to um, create a pledge that is essentially committing the cities to address those systemic inequalities in the food system that contribute to food insecurity and poor nutrition in some of those marginalized communities. And we are very lucky to be working in the city where um, the politicians really kind of understood the importance of food to our city and that it's not just important for health it's also important for our economy and it's important for our sense of identity so this food justice pledge and um, which was a catalyst for the series of webinars on this topic came out of a series of conversations during the covid pandemic where we were sharing with cities across the world how difficult it was to feed the people and how challenging it was, not just because of what was going on in our own cities, but actually this was a global conversation. And we wanted this to be a vehicle for which uh, we can talk and engage with cities in this space. And this opportunity to now continue doing that through this series of webinar, I think is really going to enhance that conversation. And Lastly, I think um, we need to acknowledge that actually food justice is a global issue for all of us, um, no matter whether you're high income or low income country. We know that um, whether you're a city that is you know, saturated by fast food or you're sitting in a food desert, food security is now an issue for every citizen across the world. And that's where this pledge is really coming from. 
in Birmingham, we still have a, a lot of work to do. We have actually in the last year seen a um, 42% increase in the number of people who have needed to use um, a food bank during this cost of living crisis, uh, which shows that actually we have a lot of issues in, in UK as well, and specifically in, in Birmingham City that uh, we want to tackle, we want to learn from, from other places and learn about the initiatives and interventions that have worked and how they have worked. And we want this webinar to be a continuation of the conversation and engagement with other cities and uh, other practitioners and experts on this topic. And we want to make sure that we are actually taking this global effort to continue to drive the necessary change and the Birmingham Food Justice Pledge is kind of a living example of the, the collective efforts of cities to be at the forefront of this change. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the resources that we developed to support this pledge um, in a latter part of the webinar. But for now, I will um, pass it on to, to Stuart to take us on to the next speaker. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Uh, Cecile, would you like to introduce the MEFPP? process, please. Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for uh, having me here. I am delighted to, to present the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Um, so if we can move to the to the first slide. Um, many of you might be familiar with the pact. It is uh, um, <clears throat> a non-binding international agreement among mayors, among cities that decided to join forces and to work uh, to develop more sustainable urban food system. Next slide. Um, in the next slide, you can uh, see um, uh, to have an overview uh, with some figures of the pact uh, in uh, uh, in its uh, last eight years of activities uh, with more than 270 cities, uh, signatory cities uh, worldwide um, in a different region and across different, uh, uh, different countries. Um, but in the next slide, you will see uh, some uh, figures related to, to Africa since uh, this, uh, this webinar is uh, uh, going to, to focus on the African continent. And you can see that uh, it is a, a, a continent where the pact is very much active. I mean, uh, signatory cities of the pact in Africa are very much active. Uh, they are 42. Uh, we have also two members of the steering committee. Uh, we have organized five regional fora. And uh, uh, most importantly, um, those signatory cities have submitted 90 uh, Milan Pact Awards practice. This is later on. I will uh, get back on on uh, on this. Um, okay. Next uh, next slide. So, but how does the pact practically and concretely uh, support the cities in in uh, in developing more sustainable urban food system? Well, first of all, it provides the framework for action, which is the core of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. It uh, lists down uh, lists down a set of thirty seven recommended actions, very concrete, very um, operational, let's say, and those actions uh, are clustered into six categories from governance to sustainable diets and nutrition, social and economic equity, food production, food supply and distribution, and food waste. So you see somehow embracing the complexity of the whole uh, food system. And those recommended actions can be uh, adapted to, um, to the different uh, local, uh, local context. If from one side is it is good to have um, a framework for inspiration with the uh, framework for action, then uh, uh, cities came up with a very concrete need of, uh, uh, and it is the one of having a monitoring tool. So together with the FAO and Rua Foundation, we have developed the, the monitoring framework. So a list of forty-four indicators, so at least one indicator uh, per uh, every recommended action. Um, so to help cities in monitoring and see if they are on track in adopting Milan Pact um, recommended actions. Um, and thirdly, the third uh, pillar somehow in the next slide, you will see uh, the Milan Pact Awards. The Milan Pact Awards, it's our tool, uh, one of our most powerful tool from one side to have knowledge of what uh, signatory cities are doing uh, worldwide. 
but also from the other is our main way to um, extract and to collect this wealth of knowledge, practice, um, experiences and policies that cities are doing and to um, take it from the local level and somehow put it uh, in a global platform for exchange. Here you see the participation in uh, the different editions uh, uh, across the six uh, editions of the Milan Impact Awards and you see that in 2022 we have received 251 practices so this really means a lot in terms of uh, willingness of cities in terms of uh, knowledge uh, sharing with their, their peers. Um, in the next slide um yeah so uh in in 2022 uh, the 2022 edition of the pact was the most participated uh, um edition of uh, of uh, of the mpa uh, and we have received uh, really a uh, lots of uh, uh, quality practices many of them were focusing on uh, on food justice here uh, i have just it is just for you to have a, a glimpse of of uh, some of those focusing on on food justice for example the city of rurkela that decided to uh, install decentralized solar powered cold room uh, facilities in municipal markets that are run by a, cooper a cooperative of uh, of women so to uh, prevent uh, vendor distress and uh, and food waste but also in the next slides, you see, um, as uh, Leticia mentioned, that uh, uh, food justice uh, is a global issue. Um, so now we go to, to Australia, to the city of, uh, of Melbourne, that decided to, to fight uh, a worryingly increasing uh, food insecurity rates in, in the city by embedding food security in the municipal plan. So they have developed this, uh, food, uh, this community food relief 2021-2020. Uh, five. Uh, in the next slide, so you have uh, uh, another um, interesting uh, um, food justice practice. Um, the city of Los, of, the, of Los Angeles uh, that launched the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network program. The, the main aim is to empower and train uh, neighborhood markets owner to become healthy food uh, food retailers. So in order to, to fight uh, food deserts and, and food swamp that uh, are uh, um, an issue uh, in many North American cities. Um, next slide, please. So you can find those practices, but many, many others uh, in uh, in the MPA 2022 report. You can download it from the QR code, but also in, a, uh, in our website. Um, so it contains the best practices, but also um, analysis on, on the trends uh, and uh, across the different categories. And uh, we believe that uh, this, uh, uh, this report together with, uh, with the other initiatives uh, um, you, you see in the next slide, uh, are very much important for uh, uh, for knowledge sharing. So meetings, webinar, field visit, advocacy, networking, trainings, and, and, and projects, and so on. Um, in the next slide, you will see... Um, uh, you can have a glimpse of uh, the the fellowship program. The uh, fellowship program is uh, uh, yeah for the reason that uh, we uh, we do support a lot uh, knowledge sharing. We have decided to launch uh, the um, when we launched the last edition of the MPA. We decided to create a set of capacity building activities to empower cities in their journey towards more sustainable uh, uh, food system. Um, that's why we have this. Uh, we launched the fellowship program that will run throughout 2024 and 2025. We uh, don't do this alone, of course. Uh, we are very lucky to have uh, many uh, partners and committed cities that uh, decided to join forces uh, with us. Um, and uh, this series of uh, of webinars is indeed part of uh, of the fellowship program. So I really would like to to thank the, the Food Foundation and the city of Birmingham um, that decided to, uh, to support us and support cities by providing them uh, very useful tools and city-tailored uh, knowledge. So uh, I am sure that uh, many cities will benefit from, uh, from uh, this. 
uh, and I'm very eager to to listen to to colleagues uh, from uh, different African cities uh, um, with all their their experience uh, and uh, and the presentation, of course, of uh, the uh, food justice uh, um, tool. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. thank you very much, Cecile. That was excellent. That's really useful. Uh, potted history and uh, fascinating insight into the evolution of, of the initiative. Um, great. So um, we will now move into yes. the next segment, which is where we hear from two of the MUFPP uh, project experiences, how in different contexts the issue of food injustice has been addressed, how projects have been developed, how they've evolved over time, successes, challenges uh, along the way. Um, so the first, uh, there will be one experience from Nairobi in Kenya, one experience from Durban in South Africa. The first will be Winfred uh, Katumo. Winfred is a Deputy Director of Food Systems in Nairobi, a long-standing civil servant in the city, uh, a lot of experience uh, working with food systems and food justice. And Winfred will be uh, talking about the Urban Early Warning, Early Action Initiative um, based in Nairobi uh, for 10 minutes, and then we will move on to the second uh, uh, Durban experience. So Winfred, please, over to you. Um, you need to unmute. I've unmuted now. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, and uh, welcome uh, our participants. I'm uh, Winfred Katumo. I'm a Deputy Director in Food Systems Nairobi. And I'll talk about uh, one of our best practices that is urban early warning, early action. And uh, this is uh, a tool which won the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact uh, Award in 2019 under the category of social and economic equity. So about, it's, my slides are not more, okay, about Nairobi, that is my outline. I'll run through that. About Nairobi, Nairobi is a capital city of Kenya, and it's also a major economic hub of uh, Eastern Africa region. It's also a home to UNEP and uh, UN Habitat. And we have a population of about uh, 4.3 million. This is according to 2019 census. But the population has now grown. We are about uh, 6 million during the day and at night about 5 million. And 60% of the population, they reside in the low income uh, informal settlements. And 22% uh, of the population, they live be below the poverty line. Why the tool? In uh, 2007 and 2008, there was an over acute food insecurity in the city. And uh, in 2009, there was no tool which could be, could be used to assess food situation in an urban setup. Because the existing rural-based indicators, they include weather, crops, acreage, and uh, this, uh, this is not applicable in an urban setup. So the global acute malnutrition, that is the AGM thresholds, when applied in a urban setting, they were leaving a huge populations unattended because they focus so much on the weather, the crops, the acreage, a, a, a and the and mm -hmm. crops. But in Nairobi, in, in, in cities all over the world, we look at the income, we also look at the lifestyles. So now this new tool of the urban early warning, early action, uh, it was needed so that because it is sensitive and it's also specific to urban set up. Under the now the surveillance, this tool, which was developed, it was developed with the, in, in collaboration with the partners, that is the city, in collaboration with the Kenya Red Cross Society, Concern Worldwide Oxfam. And uh, these partners, they had begun developing this tool in 2010, up to around 2016, but now it became operational in, uh, in uh, 2019, and uh, it has four, 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 four things. That is uh, 
it, it has four levels of measuring the food situation. When it's a normal situation, when it's a lot, when it's a lamb, and when it's emergency. And then we have five. We have uh, five situation phases. That is the, uh, th th this one's the, the surveillance indicators, the thresholds, equivalized monthly income, because now you, as I told you, the other tool talks about the, the, the yields per hectare, Maybe it also talks about uh, the weather, but here now we talk about the income in a urban setup. We are also look at the households with uh, a stable income earners, also looking at the number of food baskets per month, and also children with diarrhea for the last one month, and also the households experiencing shock in the last one month. So these are the indicators which are used in an urban setup so that now we are able to identify the poor out of the poorest. The surveillance again, this uh, it's listing is meant using a census on all households in a target area. And here in Nairobi, we focused, we, we usually focus on three, uh, three informal settlements. That is Kibira, Mukuru and Korogosho. And as you can see, this is a, an area of now the Korogosho and when we go to an area, a settlement or a village, we, we use the boundaries. We, 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 we use the boundaries, we draw according to the villages, we segment those areas according to the villages, and also the settlements, they are stratified based on that area. You can see here we, the way we have segmented. This is one of the informal settlements, that is Korogosho. And the uh, households, they are assembled and they're identified randomly. So yes, you can see this Korogosho area, we randomize. You can pick an area from this corner, you can pick another corner, another corner, but you make sure the whole area is covered. Again, uh, these are the three settlements we focus on. Like now Mukuru, you can see the number of households and the sampled size was 360. Uh, Korogosho, this is the number of households. We usually sample this number. Kibira, 70,000, but the sampled was 350. So out of a population of about two or 3,000, the sampling size was 1055. And then even as we sample the households, we also go to three markets in the settlements to make sure we also collect the, the, the markets, they tell us, they inform us about the food prices in that locality. So that we can also determine the cost of the food basket. Then uh, in data collection, when we go down to the actual data collection, we have the uh, numerators, we have the supervisors and also the team leader. And the uh, data is supposed to be collected every for seven days every, that is every two months, that is like six times a year. And each data collection mission comprises uh, the nine enumerators, three market uh, price data enumerators and the three supervisors and a leader, I've talked about it. The collection per se, uh, we have a refresher training one day and the, enumerator, the enumerators are located a list of the households. And then we carry out face-to-face -face interviews and we use the cell phones. We use the, the COBO tool to collect data. And data is analyzed uh, through a dashboard and the dashboard gives us a real-time uh, results. That is data collection exercise in one of the informal settlements, as you can see. Yeah, that is, uh, you can see the Red Cross wearing the t-shirts that they usually provide us also for security purposes. And uh, some of the results in August 2020, this is the last time we conducted the surveillance. And you can see, this is how now, this, uh, this is the, now a report from the dashboard. This is how it comes out. And here you can tell that Mukuru is severely affected as compared now to Korogosho and Kibira. When it's red, that is a Manchese. When it's yellow, that is an alert. And when it's green, it's an alarm. So you can see 
out of the three informal settlements, if you have to give help, first you will go to Mukuru, and then followed by Kibira, and then you go to Korogosho. So this is a real-time data uh, results report which is generated by the dashboard. We have a feedback structure, as you can see. And we have, and now after getting the surveillance data, we, the Department of Agriculture now writes to the Disaster Management Office. And then now for, we also give to other agencies and also the sub-county. We have uh, in Nairobi, we have now this, from the county, we have the sub-counties. We also have the disaster management committees. And from there, we are able also to communicate so that we can have early action and also early response. Uh, when and now everything is uh, normal, when it, everything is normal, we th these are the responses we do. That is the step in our production, food supply, trainings, that is stockpiling of the food and the food supplements, also mapping uh, the vulnerable households, also conserving fodder. Same to the alert. You can see also to the alarm what happens. And when it comes now to the emergency, that is now where we take up now the issuing of the food relief, the cash transfer, and also other social protection so that we can save on life. Outcomes of the surveillance, we are able, the have food in secure households, they are, they, 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 they are identified with evidence. And again, the issue is addressed so that now the food insecurity issues are addressed using the report. And also the report also gives us a trend in food insecurity. And uh, this one aids in the planning uh, for the programs and projects so that the vulnerables can be assisted. And also this is also building, building resilience and also sustainability because we also, it's also good to create something which can give uh, people resilience and also build that, uh, you, you build the consistency. They need, if it's production, they need to produce if it's something they are doing, we also build it up. And also I've said, this is the one, the tool which won in 2019 under that. You can see some of the responses we do, even as we give the food relief, we try to build capacity. We try to support uh, groups. This is a group in one of the informal settlements of Mukuru. You can see supporting them with micro gardens so that they can, they, can, they can become independent somehow and also become food secure. This is another group in Korogosho. They are doing food waste management that is organic waste. And they're also making money out of this. This is briquette making, cooking, formicacha, soap making from the, the, the potatoes, and also compost making from the organic butter of the market. And again, I've said this is a word which won in 2019. Thank you so much for listening to me. That's great, Winford. Thank you so much. Fascinating insight into, into the project, its evolution, um, and the extraordinary range of activities. And uh, your, your photos were fa fascinating to see the, the practicalities and the realities of, of that. Thank you so much for that. Um, we will now move to, I am not sure, actually, if we have the second speaker of this uh, session, uh, of this segment. <clears throat> Sikolowe, is Sikolowe online? I don't think so. Uh, let me just have a look. So, no, I don't believe so. So, uh, we will have to try and slot the second presentation in later. I think we can move to the next segment, which is where we ask two regional experts on food justice and human rights to food uh, to speak from their perspectives uh, over their long and distinguished careers in this field. Uh, and first off, we will hear from uh, a colleague of mine from the past. I worked with Liz, uh, earlier uh, with Transform Nutrition, and we had, uh, that was quite a while ago. Um, Liz, uh, welcome to hear your views uh, on urban food justice and your perspectives from Nairobi and Eastern Africa. Over to you for 10 minutes, thank you.
So Sorry, I was okay. unable to unmute myself. I think there was some restriction, but no, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much um, for, uh, for this opportunity. So uh, let me just load my presentation. Right, we just did. Yes, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, urban food justice perspective from uh, uh, talking about lived experiences of Kenyans, the urban poor in Kenya. And um, this is a great opportunity to talk about the issue of uh, food justice and human rights, because this is a very important issue, and especially when it comes to the urban poor. So uh, we, we are aware of the universal human rights for people to feed themselves in dignity. And our constitution in Kenya uh, has, has domesticated this right. Um, and uh, uh, it indicates that every person has a right, has the right to be free from hunger and to have adequate food of acceptable quality. So, um, so this is this has been domesticated, and um, policies in Kenya have also tried to, um, to 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 include the issue of the right to food, or at least uh, ensuring that people are free from hunger. So we have, like for example, the National Food and Nutrition Security Policy, which uh, talks about uh, the right to food and uh, actualizing the right to food as an objective and really focusing on marginalized populations and vulnerable populations, including the urban poor. And we, we also have uh, country-specific food system strategies that also focus on, uh, on promoting the right uh, uh, food security generally and freedom from hunger. And for example, we have the, the Nairobi uh, food system strategy for 2021-2025, which, uh, which indicate, which uh, promotes uh, the food security for the, uh, especially for the urban poor. And um, talking about uh, uh, support for food production, Within, within the city to create resilience and also uh, providing access to water because that's a major challenge and also um, supporting enterprises, the small uh, and medium enterprises within the city to promote food security among other strategies. However, despite uh, the, the, pol the policy framework that exists in Kenya, the, the right to food is not actualized for many. And especially when you talk about the urban poor, over 80% of the households in urban poor settings in Nairobi are food insecure. And uh, uh, from work that we've done before, we found that uh, close to half of children under five years are stunted. So there is, this is a major concern despite the policy framework that we have. So we, uh, in the last few years, we have been uh, engaging communities in these settings in several urban poor communities in Nairobi, but also in Kisumu. But today I'll focus more on Nairobi. And um, we, have, we have been engaging them to really understand the, the issue of how they experience the issue of the right to food and um, to hear their perspectives. And we have used uh, participatory methodologies, for example, photo voice, digital storytelling, dialogues, to just understand their perspectives, their experiences, to really be able to establish their, their lived experiences. Uh, so what we have heard from people, they tell us that food is available in the market around them, but it's not available in their house. And this is mainly because of the issue of economic access. Uh, when uh, when, uh, when um, uh, Madame Katumo was talking, uh, she talked about the, 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 the tool that they have developed, which includes, um, which includes uh, economic access or the, the issue of uh, 
livelihoods. So many people in these settings do not have access, uh, economic access. They don't have uh, adequate livelihoods to be able to, uh, to, 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 be able to ensure that they, they access food. So they say there is plenty food in their surrounding, but they don't have money. So despite the food available in their households, they are hung hungry. And uh, this issue is, uh, so they have talked about, uh, like for example, in the case of children, many children, they depend on the one meal. Sometimes there are some schools that offer meals in school. So, so they say that sometimes many children depend on that one meal from school and they don't have uh, food at home. And so when in schools, in schools where children are not given food, those children are very vulnerable because they may not access a meal or uh, uh, they, they access meals sporadically. Uh, we also have the issue of physical access for people with, uh, uh, with disability and especially the older people. Some of them, they tell us, even when they have money to access, they have limited access to, uh, to food because of economic access, given their disability. But even when they have money, sometimes they have to sleep hungry because they do not have, um, they, they, do, they are not able to move around to access the food and they don't have support to be able to ensure that they, they access food physically. And this was like a, a photo voice uh, working with older women. Uh, and many of them have these kind of disabilities. They are not able to access food. So the, the other issue is food quality and safety. In the When we talk about the right to food, we are talking about uh, freedom from hunger, but also uh, the right to adequate food. And in terms of food adequacy, we are talking about the quality of food, the safety of food, and also acceptability. And um, people uh, talk about the, the issue of the, the safety of the food in their environment. The environment is not conducive for safety of the food. And they, they say that sometimes they don't have a choice. They just have to eat what is available for to them. And uh, sometimes it's because of the economic access. So the, what they can afford is what is not hygienically produced or, uh, or uh, prepared. And uh, so they end up uh, eating suboptimal food because of the issue of access. So uh, we, we did more engagement during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so the same issues came up, but they were even more uh, ex uh, ex um, exaggerated during this COVID-19 period. The picture you see here is of a woman. This is not uh, from our engagement. These are uh, from the media. Uh, it was a woman in a different uh, urban poor setting uh, in Kenya, and she was captured as boiling stones for to feed her boiling stones to make their, the children think that she was cooking food for them so that uh, eventually they they wait until they sleep. And that re was repeating. Uh, so because she had nothing else to cook for them. So she was just like uh, letting them think that she was cooking so that they wait. And when they wait, they just sleep and, um, uh, and the following day it repeats. And uh, this was this 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 sounds like a a very um, a, a rare case, but many many people in the in in urban poor settings were talking about having nothing to cook for them for their children because there was um, many many people were during that period there was massive livelihood loss. In normal cases, we have issues of livelihood uh, as, as as major issues, but during this period, it even became worse. There was a uh, disruption of food supply because of the lockdown, well, like when, when there were restrictions of movement from rural areas to urban areas. So there was also res restriction of movement of food. And that affected especially the urban poor who depend on purchased food generally. And then there were some safety nets. There were development of uh, organizations that were providing food 
for people during that period. And also the government instituted a cash transfer program, but it was inadequate. The money was very little and it was also not uh, given to many people. It was only reaching very few people. And, um, and it was marred with irregularities. So, uh, and also it was only for a very short period, only four months, but the COVID-19 period lasted a long period, like one year, the, the intensive period. So people are still very vulnerable. So uh, during these periods of vulnerability, uh, uh, and which is like the the case in in these settings most of the time they they, they are vulnerable they have de devised uh, scoping strategies some of them skipping meals like some saying uh, they they only have one meal or they don't even have a meal in a day if they don't have access to the food uh begging some uh some steal some actually scavenge food from uh from dump sites. And there is also the issue of child labor where the parents send their children to the streets to beg for food or to go and collect uh, scrap metal so that they can make some money and buy food. And then there is the issue of sex for money and uh, or food. And uh, also um, for young girls, they sometimes they are forced to marry early and this happened a lot during the COVID-19 so that they can get uh, food. So uh, we also learned during the, especially during the COVID-19 period, there was uh, people, as, as a way of coping, people started doing some level of urban farming in these settings uh, as a way of creating resilience and uh, being able to provide food for their families. And uh, so um, at APHRC, we, I, I work from the African Population and Health Research Center, APHRC. And uh, during this period, we came up with an initiative called the Zero Hunger Initiative. And this initiative, we, we, are, we are working with youth and women groups in these urban poor settings to help them uh, optimize uh, urban farming as a way of creating resilience in these communities. During the engagement, these people are saying if they are supported to do urban farming, they would they would appreciate because that would help uh, them to feed their families with uh, with uh, with food with good food, and they also youth youth who are telling us that they are idle and they, they don't have anything to do, and if they had some some support for urban farming, that would occupy they would create employment for them. So this, we are also doing it from an economic empowerment for the youth and also women. So uh, the other aspect is uh, advocacy. So we, uh, we do a lot of advocacy. We continue to engage the communities to, for them to understand the, the, the concept of the right to food and to be able to, 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 to enhance their agency, to demand for their rights. So we've been working with uh, many youth groups to actually engage their communities on the right to food. We have also developed some tools like a creative coffee table book on the issue of talking about the lived experiences of the urban poor with the issue of food security and the right to food. We have developed things like co uh, policy briefs, comic, and uh, even animation just for engagement and advocacy. We have, uh, we have, we are, we have come, we are piloting a, a zero hunger movement, which we want to launch to be able to engage uh, people more uh, in, in different settings, but also engaging policymakers and other actors in the space to, to be able to actualize the right to food for the urban poor. And we have a right to food coalition, which is a, a coalition of different organizations that are in the space of the right to food and who want to um, who want to promote the right to food for, for, for communities in Kenya, including the urban poor. And there are other activities by other organizations like the Nja Revolution, which is by um, some grassroots organizations that want to, to, uh, to make their voice hard about the, their right to food. 
So thank you uh, for your attention. Great, thank you, Liz. That was excellent. Uh, and lived experience has been long neglected as a, an essential part of our kind of research as a research tool. And it's great to, to hear you discuss that and to share those experiences, uh, including those extraordinary coping strategies in the face of uh, uh, food injustice and, and, and stress. Um, that that was excellent. We will now move to South Africa, and we will ask uh, Basiso Moyo, uh, who is working with the University of Western Cape and also the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, activist scholar with a lot of experience in human rights to food, food sovereignty, uh, food justice. Over to you, Basiso. Um, greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, Stuart, just between me and you in terms of those slides, are you able to assist me with lighting those? Uh, I don't. Um, I don't. I think Latis, you may have. A, I thought you may be sharing your own slides, but um, oh, I. Yeah. Uh, Leticia, we'll, you... we'll just share those now. Yeah, no. Oh, you can do that. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, they're Great. coming up. Absolutely. All right. Sorry about that. There we go. No problem. Um, and yeah, once again, just to say thank you to Elizabeth for that very insightful uh, presentation that speaks to the lived experiences of this topic. A lot of what was shared uh, also mirrors the, the South African experience. So thank you very much for that. Um, and perhaps just to get us going, um, okay, as, as I wait for the slides. No problem. Nothing on my side. Okay. Right now. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're coming. Yes. That's it. Right. Great. Um, so just to say, yeah, in light of what, you know, Elizabeth has already alluded to in terms of <clears throat> tapping into the lived experiences of this issue, I think I'd just like to pick up where she left off and then, you know, speak about how we can then bring about some type of transformative accountability, you know, when we speak about the injustice that is prevalent, particularly when we zone in on the food value chain uh, and the dynamics and the modalities therein. So just to get us going, I just wanted us perhaps as my point of departure, we can go to the first slide. Um, slide, uh, slides are gone, Leticia. Oh, okay. Uh, is, okay. Can people see the slides? Because I, I don't see them on my side. No, uh, I, I hear they come again. Okay, yes. yeah, just, yeah. Okay. we can just go straight to the first one. Okay, Thanks. great. Yeah, so I wanted to touch on this idea of, of constitutional fidelity, particularly zoning in on the South African experience, because largely when we look at a, a good chunk of these socioeconomic struggles, they've, they've all found expression through, you know, what we've embraced as public interest litigation in this country. So because of the inequality that South Africa faces, there's always this dichotomy, you know, between uh, a two-tiered sort of lived experience to our socioeconomic ambition. So on the one hand, we've got, you know, private and public health care, private and public education, public and private tr uh, transport systems, even financial systems and so forth. But strangely enough, when we tap into, you know, the idea of the right to food, there's not much, uh, you know, a, a, a legislative contest that have ensued in this space that could give us a more credible and a more grounded understanding of, of, of you know, the content of the right to food. So in light of this, uh, in, in light of this absence of any, you know, worthwhile sort of public interest litigation that has ensued around this issue, it's, it's very mind boggling because South Africa has this very strong heritage, you know, whereby in so far as confronting many of these injustices, you know, we, we tend to lean on this idea of constitutional fidelity. And then uh, moving on from that, then I guess it's also to say that, you know, part of it is that we need to also understand, you know, the paradigms that we embrace when we approach and seek to unpack uh, um, um, the issue of food insecurity, malnutrition uh, and, and hunger. And I think the importance of narratives and framings then becomes very crucial. But like I said, in light of also trying to give, trying to define and further this discourse, what type of relief? Uh, are we looking for? So if the courts had to give us their audience and they say, right, how do we safeguard against 
the violation and the regression that is currently taking place when it comes to the right to food, how then would we assist them in sort of trying to define that particular arena? And I think with that said, and when we look at the complexity that comes with food systems, there's just, you know, two distinctions I wanted to make as I delve into my presentation, which is that, you know, there's obviously the issue of inequality. And in light of the fact that South Africa uh, is regarded as the most unequal society in the world, what we then, you know, obviously see at the forefront are these differences, right, across uh, population groups and constitutions. Uh, that speaks to the observed differences in food and security nutrition outcomes. But I think what I'm trying to lean on today is this idea of, of, of an inequity, right? Speaking to the, 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 the avoidable reasons, so to speak, right? Why an even distribution exists and why disadvantage accrues, particularly zoning in on this idea of the quality of life in city regions, particularly of the global South and more so in South Africa. And because, you know, um, the, the political economy of different stakeholders is, is something that we also cannot play a blind eye to. Why? Because, you know, power is very discursive. So we need to understand, uh, we need to have a force field analysis of where power is located uh, and try, as much as possible to try and get rid of these assumptions. And what am I talking about? I'm saying, what does the right to food uh, mean for you know, the CEO of a multinational corporation? What does the right to food mean for subsistence, uh, smallholder farmers, you know, under on the on, on the on, on the on, on the on the edges of, 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 of urban urban centers, so to speak. Uh, what does the right to food mean for, for informality? And what does it mean for activist scholars and human rights defenders uh, such as myself? But beyond that, it's also about interrogating the statecraft at play, right? So looking and, and, and playing open cards about the capacity of the state, both technically and strategically to, to somewhat, you know, bring about a nourishing food system for all. So these at face value are some of the, you know, the key issues I thought that I would, you know, point out to in so far as, you know, uh, an, an understanding of right to food struggles as they affect, uh, you know, city regions in, in, in South Africa. Uh, we now move on to the next slide. And so in light of this, 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 this point of departure that speaks to the fact that, you know, South Africa has the highest inequality in the world, what we're now experiencing is that even post-COVID, you know, matters have been made worse, uh, you know, by an income crisis post-lockdown. But not only that, because cities themselves are also, you know, these these centers for economic opportunities. So what we now see is that there's a lot of internal and external migration, you know, within within South Africa. Part of it speaks to some of the, you know, regional imbalances in terms of, you know, flows from, you know, external countries coming into South Africa, but also there's heavy internal migration in South Africa, whereby people li uh, leave the rural areas, you know, in uh, looking for economic opportunities in the cities and, you know, they expect the city to feed them. And part of that is also about understanding, you know, how best then we can, we, we can make sense of this, of, of this particular reality and context, because, you know, even, you know, from a, from a, from a national minimum wage perspective, um, you know, I made it a point to, 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 to somewhat, you know, just flesh out, some of these uh, <clears throat> problematic issues, because when you look at something like the consumer price index, which is very flawed because it is somewhat skewed towards the elite, you find that even wages cannot even meet, you know, a minimum basic needs basket. So how then do we, you know, find common ground in so far as you know safeguarding and ensuring that the right to food uh, is, is 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 something attainable uh, for those at the bottom of the pyramid? So in light of uh, dual economy thesis in South Africa, which speaks to the fact that there are people who experience the food system as, you know, <clears throat> some would in a first world country. And then there are those within South Africa who experience the food system as if they're in a war zone of some sort. So it becomes very problematic. But more than that, 
part of it then is about, you know, what is the role of meaningful employment, right, in, in safeguarding the right to food. So in a context of high unemployment, in a context of massive landlessness and a history of dispossession, um, how do we give meaning and effect to, to this idea of, of, of the right to food? But more than that, I think because of this dual economy thesis that I'm briefly touching on, you know, part of it then is to then say, how do we credibly intervene within within the food value chain because here we are talking of something uh that is firmly you know within the private sector but has its impact on 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 the public good so how how, how do we go about you know finding that common ground getting rid of assumptions and ensuring that you know we all sing from the same hymn book in so far as ensuring that you know, this this appreciation of a human rights based framework is at the core and at the center of the policy landscape and more importantly, uh, uh, the agenda setting that 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 comes with that terrain. Um, next slide, please. Right. So no. Next one. Oh, yeah, there we go. No. <laughs> Yeah, so there we go. So explicitly speaking in South Africa, what we what we have is, you know, uh, um, the codification of, you know, the right to food and nutrition in sections 27 of the Constitution. Uh, and often, you know, elsewhere, you know, it, it is said that this rhetoric speaks to this idea of progressive realization. So speaking to, you know, available state resources and how those are managed to ensure that, you know, there is some progress in so far as advocating, protecting, promoting and safeguarding the right to food. But there's a particular distinction I also want to make in that in Section 28 of the South African Constitution, there is a particular focus on children's rights. And when we zone into that particular sphere, what we then realize that the difference between Section 27 and Section 28 of the South African Constitution is that when we then zone in on, you know, children's rights, those are absolute, meaning that they are not subject to progressive realization. And when we start to look at, you know, statistical indicators, when we start to look at, you know, the policy landscape, we then also realize that, you know, for the longest time, uh, South Africa has been very regressive in so far as children's rights are concerned, in particular, you know, the right to nutrition. And, you know, often I've, I've argued this extensively elsewhere to say then how also do we ensure that cities are at the forefront of articulating the fact that, you know, malnutrition in particular is not necessarily a clinical condition, but it is something, you know, that speaks to political outcomes. And, you know, South Africa is 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 a firsthand experience of, of, of what it looks like living children behind. So at the time of, of presenting, uh, you know, to you to you folks today, uh, the South African Human Rights Commission has just produced a report uh, speaking to the fact that, you know, the, the the situational analysis in the Eastern Cape province is particularly dire when we look at children's rights and their nutrition and the right to food. And currently there are ongoing discussions about, you know, how best the state can then respond to that. So when we see a chapter nine institution, chapter nine institutions being these institutions that are set up to support constitutional democracy, coming out being very vocal about the fact that we have violated a whole lot of children's rights in South Africa by not ensuring that there is some type of credibility given to this codification <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that we find in section 28. Um, and I think that's something we also need, need to reflect on. But beyond that, I think this is also about polycentric governance because this is a convergence of a whole range of issues, particularly when we zone in uh, in, into the urban context. And, you know, when you realize that, you know, things like agriculture in particular, these are not necessarily, you know, local government competency issues. And when you realize that because we have a three, uh, we have a three tiered sort of government uh, governance approach uh, <clears throat> in South Africa, what you then realize is that the provincial sphere and the local governance sphere 
uh, <clears throat> are, 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 are strictly operational spheres of government. And as a result of that, what we then have are a lot of bottlenecks that we experience when we are trying to engage and advance dialogue around food systems transformation. And because of that, <clears throat> then for, for me, I, perhaps I want to speak to this idea of the infrastructure of nurture, right? Because when you're looking at city regions, there's a, you know, it's a very convoluted space that rightfully so speaks to the complexity uh, that comes with food systems. So, you know, uh, Elizabeth touched on some of the physical, social, uh, and, and political underpinnings of this issue, but I wanted to then amplify that and speak about this idea of infrastructures, right? That enable urban well-being. So have we counted the cost? Are we in tune with the quality of life in city regions, particularly of the global south? So when we realize how do we embrace this idea of poverty, because in essence, how do poor people, those at the bottom of the pyramid, <clears throat> uh, how are they empowered to put a claim on their right to food? So if I'm hungry, whose problem is that? More so when I have a constitutionally codified right to food, how do I go about giving expression uh, to that particular human right? But we also know this is more and more becoming about, you know, the food, energy, water nexus. Uh, in South Africa, we're experiencing major, major uh, energy insecurity at the moment. We are also, you know, we have bubblings of, you know, water crisis that is looming as well. So we also have to understand how all of these things then converge, you know, to to, to then further further make this this discussion of ours complicated. Um, you know, and then there's also the idea of, you know, maternity protection and gender, because ultimately, once again, when we zone in on children's rights, you know, those start way early on when we speak about the first 1000 days, those start in the womb and so forth. So how do we ensure that all these things are central to this idea of food systems transformation and trying to counter the, the, the injustice that is so prevalent uh, in the in the food value chain? But then again, you know, I wanted to also point out to the fact that no, we shouldn't be given to easy analysis when we're engaging in this topic, because more so, you know, um, complexity uh, demands that we are somewhat nuanced uh, in, in, our, in our response to, to, to the many challenges and this wicked problem of food insecurity and malnutrition. And part of it is to, you know, have an appetite of embracing dissonance. And this speaks to the fact that, you know, some of the views that we take as universal, you know, I think we should take a step back and understand that some of these perspectives require significant uh, reflexivity, uh, particularly when, you know, we, we grapple and, and, and dig, dig, dig deep into the politics, uh, into the politics of place. Um, and, 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 and I guess part of that then is also to understand the coping strategies of those at the bottom of the pyramid, something that Elizabeth also touched on at face value. And for me, it's about, you know, drawing back to this idea of social capital as a policy response. So where policy falls, uh, falls short, how, we, how, how are we understanding how people are, are coping with, you know, individually and within communities? Uh, particularly, you know, speaking to this idea of a solidarity economy, something that, you know, stems from, from, from this principle or this uh, ethic of food sovereignty that is also, you know, gaining traction of late. So, and then obviously there's, you know, informality. So how are city regions embracing, engaging, and also uh, um, seeking to intervene within the informal sphere, but in such a way that they are not then, you know, formalizing that with which we have described as, as informality. And then because, you know, of this inequality context of ours, you know, when you come into the city regions, you then have to also ask yourself, right, what does food inequality look like? So what do the rich consume uh, in comparison to the, to the broader majority of, of the population? And once we are clear on that, what does that mean in terms of the quality of food that's available in shelves? What does that mean in terms of the cultural dimension uh, that comes with the right to food and nutrition? Not, and, and that's not to mention issues around aff affordability uh, and you know production and consumption, speaking more broadly to food environments, the entrenchments of supermarkets when people's wages are low uh, and so forth. And then I guess as well, in the words of Raj Patel, ultimately this embrace or this understanding of <clears throat> the right to food 
well, anchored uh, anchored in a food sovereignty sort of narrative, ultimately speaks about you know this vigilance we need to have when it comes to food democracy, and which is that constantly it's a right to act. So when we have you know the bread price fixing scandal taking place, when we have the listeriosis outbreak, you know how have we responded to these issues? Have we seized these windows of opportunity? to try and define the content of the right to food? Have we seized these windows of opportunity to try and you know, amplify some of the bottlenecks that you know, seemingly we are also not clear on in terms of providing some type of credible solution? And then I'll now move on to my last slide. <clears throat> And then so ultimately, in terms of, you know, providing some type of, you know, agency, um, once again, you know, when it comes to this issue, I think <clears throat> what is core and my, 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 my take home message for everyone today is that let's not be given to easy analysis because we're dealing with complexity here. But more importantly, it's also about reorient, reorienting or recalibrating you know, South African food systems in such a way that, you know, we can all then tap into this power to convene, you know, and try to then reframe the problem uh, and be in tune with that, with, with what the policy landscape entails and demands from us, but also being clear on, on, on the incentives at play, because, you know, once again, food systems are complex and these are very wicked problems. Um, but more than that, I think also it's about understanding, you know, where the pushback is currently coming from. You know, we see a lot of policy inertia in this place. And oftentimes, <clears throat> I've always said to some of my civil society colleagues that even if we had <clears throat> the audience of the <clears throat> the audience of the first citizen of the country, if the president had to come into the room and say, what is the problem with food systems? Uh, I, I don't think we are necessarily clear on the type of relief we're looking for at this stage. So part of it is about, you know, convening, identifying specific and strategic policy solutions. Um, and then here in, I think as well, there's a role for civil society, particularly in light of this idea of the legal opportunity structure of the country and how over time and historically, um, you know, there's been many contestations driven by public interest litigation uh, that have advanced a lot of socioeconomic struggles in South Africa. So just at face value, some of the NGOs that are currently immersed in, in this issue, although they're just a handful of them, you know, we have the Healthy Leaving Alliance, which were very integral in advancing uh, in bringing about that health promotion levy that we saw on sugary and 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 uh, uh, on, on sugary beverages and and taxes that then you know followed up on that, uh, so they're doing a great job. We've got the Peter Marisburg Economic Justice and Dignity Group. These are the guys who are very committed to you know monitoring the consumer price index, food prices, and the coping strategies of those uh, that are at the uh, that are at the bottom of the pyramid. But then again, COVID nineteen has come and gone. We saw a whole lot of, you know, COVID-19 coalitions that came about. And I think that was encouraging to show that, you know, more and more people uh, are getting are getting involved in this particular issue. We saw community action networks coming to the fore and really uh, carrying the burden of, of food insecurity and malnutrition in the country. And then obviously there's uh, uh, international organizations like the Council for Local Environmental uh, initiatives, ECLAIR that works very closely as well with many uh, city governments in South Africa. They've been doing great work in the Western Cape and particularly in Guazulu Natal. And <clears throat> I'm told that, you know, they, 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 they're currently working on a standalone South African chapter. So all of this <clears throat> is encouraging. But lastly, then just to say that, you know, ultimately it's also about, you know, engaging with the politics, right? So we need to capacitate policy practitioners, we need to understand uh, the political economy of this issue so that, you know, we are clear on that force field analysis and particularly where, you know, the low hanging fruits are in so far as some of our advocacy efforts are, uh, are located. But more than that, perhaps in so far as also building towards this idea of a future agenda that is cognizant of this food, energy, water nexus, speaking also to, clim to climate concerns and perhaps creating institutional structures, right, that enable this cross-sectoral uh, partnerships and dialogues to take place. Uh, case in point is that in South Africa at the moment, the national policy on food and security uh, 
uh, for for the country uh, comes to an end this year, and it served its ten year cycle, which once again presents an opportunity for us to come together and try to provide a credible roadmap uh, for the future. And part of that is to then say, you know, who has that power to convene? Who has that power to, you know, be at the center of that agenda setting in such a way that we get rid of those assumptions? We place a human rights-based framework at the center and at the core of this discussion and just try to, to ensure that the right to food is upheld and safeguarded for all and so far as bringing about a nourishing food system in South Africa. So that's all I had to share with you today, and I hope I've, I've done it justice. Thanks again, everyone. Great. Thank you, Basito. That was, that was excellent. And really important to remind us that food system transformation, which is becoming a bit of a cliche, demands that we look at, we interrogate issues of food justice, agency, uh, and human rights. It, it has to be based on a, on a, a transformation, a, a transformational approach rather than an incremental approach, which uh, tends to be the case, unfortunately, too often. So that's really important, really key. We are running a little late on time, but we will move ahead. Uh, thank you so much for all our speakers. Uh, great insights, complementary insights, which is which is important. Uh, we, we should hopefully have time for a few questions at the end, but I'm gonna ask Leticia Petrovic from the Food Foundation to introduce a new innovation, a new tool that uh, we have been involved in with Birmingham City Council through Food Foundation Birmingham City Council as part of the MUFPP. Uh, this summer, which is a global food justice toolkit. So I'll hand over to you, Leticia, to introduce the toolkit. So as I mentioned at the start of the webinar, we've been working very closely with Birmingham City Council um, and following the Global Cities Justice Pledge, we wanted to uh, build on that and create a database of resources uh, which had the collection of those interventions, policies and strategies that have been implemented worldwide to help uh, policymakers navigate challenges and maximize um, those positive outcomes. So we use the MUFPP framework for action to organize interventions um, that address food injustice into those five thematic sections covering governance, social and economic equity, food production, food supply and distribution, and food waste and recycling. And what I just want to do quickly is give you a bit of a taste of what the um, toolkit actually looks like. So I'm going to try and navigate this to basically show you where you can find that information. So um, I'm just going to do a quick demo of what this uh, database essentially looks like. So um, on the and I'll pop the chat into the I'll pop the link into the chat later. You'll be able to uh, download the intervention databases for each of those thematic areas that I just um, covered. So within each of the database, there is an opportunity to look at different themes and sub themes for each of uh, the key five areas. So this is an example of the social and economic equity database intervention. And you'll see that uh, the toolkit, the, the spreadsheet is organized into different themes, sub themes, and you will also be able to then um, filter this based on the region, country, and the uh, city area. So uh, if you wanted to look at the interventions from any of the MUFPP regions, you'll be able to change that here. Uh, we also then included the description of the intervention and uh, what each of the intervention covers. So there is um, the link to the target population, as well as the impact of the intervention the kind of high level summary. And then there are uh, relevant links and link studies to those particular interventions. And you'll be able to do that across all of the five different things. So there's essentially five different databases. We have over 316 studies um, and interventions that have been evaluating evaluated. And we hope that this will be a tool that we can build on and develop um, based on the this kind of webinar series. Uh, we want to make sure that we are um, enriching this database with the case studies that we've heard today. We're going to hear in the following uh, webinars as well throughout this fellowship. So um, as I said at the start, the Global Food Justice Pledge was just the start. We want to make sure that we are enabling the, the policymakers 
the change makers um, working on the food system transformation globally. So um, we hope this database will be a starting point to look at some of those interventions that are um, have been implemented, that are uh, working and look at what are some of those key challenges and barriers that need to be overcome to be able to implement those interventions. Um, in addition to the intervention database, we've also developed a self-assessment toolkit, which um, should be used as an accompanying tool to this uh, intervention database which uh, also allows you to kind of look at some of those key areas uh, of strengths and weaknesses together with uh, the kind of teams that are working in local authorities and cities on the, the food systems transformation, tackling some of these challenges. And hopefully that will also allow you to start linking some of those interventions to a particular areas of strengths and weaknesses in your city. And just to highlight that this is um, just a first iteration of this, of this tool, Kit, and we want to make sure that um, we get the feedback and understand what is useful, uh, whether it is working or whether we can enrich it in any way. So uh, I'll share the link to the place where you can download that on our uh, website, and we would very much encourage your input and um, feedback on how and if we can enrich the date both the database as well as the the self-assessment um, tool so I will pause here because I know we have a lot of questions to go through so um, hopefully I will be able to share that with all of you just uh, in a second and then uh, looking forward to hearing your feedback and comments on this database thank you great thank you Leticia excellent uh, resource and a living resource it will be updated and then we need to understand and share experiences of applying it and, and using it uh, over time so that's great thank you i'm looking for questions online i don't see any maybe they are somewhere else um but actually if you do have questions for any of the speakers we have you can raise your hand in in the in the chat Bar. Is it a chat? But wherever you're supposed to raise your hand. If you raise your hand, we may be able to see you and give you the opportunity to ask that question directly on screen, um, either with video or without video. So, um, Leticia, have you seen questions coming in which I've somehow managed to fail to see? <laughs> Just checking that I'm looking in the right place. I haven't. I have <laughs> I've not seen any questions, but if anyone does have any questions right. and would like to come in uh, verbally, please do just um, raise your hands and we'll be able to allow you to, to come in and ask those. Right. So anyone, please feel free. Questions. I'm looking. Some excellent presentations. I'm sorry we lost the call away. Uh, we're not quite sure what happened there. Uh, with regard to the the Durban um, presentation. Um, but we've had some great insights and experiences from our speakers. Um, we're not seeing any questions. It's Friday. Before Christmas. Yeah. Okay. We don't see questions. Um, if anyone would just like to come in with any comments or feedback or comments. On, the, yeah. on the webinar and what you would like to see moving forward, uh, please do feel free to raise your hand as well. Okay, I don't see any raised hands. Uh, Okay, um, I will wrap up the the session. Um, I think it's been a fascinating sort of walk through the reality of, of food injustice and the way it's being responded to in different contexts in, in Eastern and Southern, Southern Africa. Um, this, I should point out, is the first of four regional webinars. We have uh, uh, Asia, in the middle of January, I think the 17th of January, and then we have in the middle of February, in the middle of March, in, in February, uh, Central and North America, 
and in, uh, in the middle of March, I think 13th, 14th of March, in South, uh, South America. Uh, similar setup with regard to uh, initiatives with the MUFPP, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact uh, Network, city initiatives, uh, looking at food justice, complemented with regional expertise and insight from speakers uh, from those regions. Uh, we will share, um, again, experiences with the toolkit uh, along the way. So those will be um, uh, coming up in the next few months. Um, so Stuart, we do actually have one question. A uh, uh, question, Barry. Good question. I will um, let Barry come in as well if he would like to ask the question in person. Barry, feel free to directly ask that. Sorry, I've been a bit in and out of it, so I might have missed it, but um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, yes, I was just, you know, looking at conflicts of interest and how, um, in your experience, big food, food corporations have affected how you can actually look at implementing the constitution in South Africa with respect to the right to food. Great, really important question. Barry uh, Basiso, would you be able to, would you like to respond to that? Uh, how has big food affected your work in, in South Africa on food justice? Um, yeah, thanks Barry for that question. I think uh, there's a lot of mysticism that, that define that space. I mean, uh, we, we've, like I said in my presentation, you know, the power expressed by, you know, uh, corporate actors in the food system is very discursive. And I don't think we're particularly clear at this stage as to how it is that they go about, you know, influencing that policy landscape and the food value chain. Um, you know, drawing back to, you know, this policy document that I'm speaking about that's coming to an end um, this year in 2023, you know the 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 national policy was was uh, was adopted under the veil of of secrecy, and I remember that you know a whole range of you know academic uh, active scholars, human rights defenders. We we really took the government to task to say once again it looks like you know you're always favoring you know corporate actors uh, within with, within the with, within the food system, and you know there was a lot of you know a, a change an overhaul in, in the change of of uh, the leadership at the Department of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries at the time, where you know the the the, the policy document was located, and you know if if anything, um, yeah, I, I don't have a clear answer for you, but what I can say, some of the low hanging fruits have come about as a result of you know some of the work which was largely funded by you know bloomberg bloomberg philanthropies which which brought about you know the health promotion levy um you know that whole taxation situation taking place uh and and now we're talking about you know bringing about this front of package labeling uh, in terms of food stuff and uh, on shelves and stuff so i mean i'm not giving you a clear answer but just to say that they're very influential they tend to have you know the government's ear uh, and the government is always, you know, open and embracive of of their concerns uh, more than they are of 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 you know the broader sort of polity and and what we raise in these in, uh, when it comes to food systems transformations and so forth. So that yeah, that forms part of my current research interest, just trying to demystify that space and having a more hands-on understanding of how it is they go about influencing the policy landscape. Yeah. Great. Uh, Barry, did you were you about to respond? No. Okay. Actually, you know, I think it's it's a key issue and it's a key challenge. Uh, the one of the one of the what I've noticed with regard to the definition of food justice or injustice is that often has tended to default to to a more of a focus on calories and and not not so much on the quality of the diet. And once we get into a the arena and the, and the whole issue and the question of of a healthy diet, a nutritious diet, it demands we look at, at the at the way big food and the way the commercial sector is acting, um, and the way it may be polluting the discourse, it may be infiltrating policy. Uh, these things are all happening. Um, what I've I'm, I've been looking at this over globally, and there's a lot of experience and history 
in Central America and South America. South Africa is interesting because with regard to uh, the sugar tax levy, which has now been shown to have an impact uh, recent, relatively recently, uh, it's one of the first experiences, I think, in, in Africa in actually getting that through and off the ground. But it's, these are always challenges and they're ongoing challenges. Uh, but I think if we, I think we have to remember the quality dimension as well as the quantity dimension when we're talking about food justice. And that requires us to look at commercial uh, behaviors of, of the big companies, transnationals, uh, which are, and it interacts with the politics. So commercial and political interact, uh, they're both key. Any, any, other, any other questions or comments? Uh, from anyone? I cannot, let me have a look down my, any hands I see? I don't see any hands. Okay, uh, we are, we are at 10.30 GMT, pretty much, which is when we were going to close. So unless I hear any last minute thoughts, comments, um, okay. So just to conclude, thank you everyone for, for participating, all the speakers and panelists, uh, the experiences of projects and regional challenges and, uh, and approaches on, on food justice. Um, and it's, it's long overdue this, uh, this kind of uh, emphasis in, in discussions of food system transformation. I, as, I, as I said, I think it's become a bit of a cliche, food systems transformation, it tends to default to Kind of tweaking at the margins a little bit too incremental and we we need a radical change and that has to be a transformative approach which is which is embedded in in issues of uh, uh, of justice and human rights um there's a way of framing that which i find is quite useful just to conclude it in terms of three pillars fair shares which is uh, uh, uh equality of outcome uh, fair play, which is a quality of opportunity or capability, and fair say, which is autonomy and agency, uh, voice, inclusion, uh, active uh, participation and power. And I also really like what um, Raj Patel said about food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is the right to act, and, and it demands, and it's action-oriented, it's about agency, and it's about power. We cannot deal with food injustice without changing the power balance within the food system. That is clear, and that goes along with equity. Um, so thank you, everybody, for your participation. Uh, and uh, I hope you are also, you're, well, you're very welcome to participate in all the other three webinars from different regions. Uh, that uh, sharing aspect is really key across the, the whole initiative. So thank, thanks, everyone, and hope to see you again.